before we get started, I wanted to um, ask Kevin Walker, the president of the Northwest Area Foundation, just to come up and share a couple words to kind of get us started. Kevin? Thanks, Martin. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you in this beautiful space uh, to talk about this report. Northwest Area Foundation is, is really delighted to have been able to be of help to Native Americans in philanthropy and uh, the Council of Nonprofits in moving this piece of research forward. And I just wanted to take a second to explain why this is important to us. Uh, Lemoyne's prayer, especially the last part of what he had to say, really captured in much better words than I have where we're coming from. Um, if, you, if you visit our office in St. Paul, one of the first things that you'll see when you walk in the door is that in big letters all down a wall, uh, it says, we believe prosperity is possible for all. We believe prosperity is possible for all. Uh, simple words, but to me that is almost a radical statement in today's world. But that is what we believe, and it is the value that animates what the Northwest Area Foundation is all about. Um, we think that the native communities in Minnesota, urban and reservation, and, and all across the eight states where we're active, are communities with a bright future. And we are committed to the idea of helping native organizations and na native people find the path towards the future of their choosing, uh, your own version of what prosperity means. We are trying to make resources available to, to move in that direction. Um, so in order to do that, it's really essential to ask ourselves what assets already exist in the Native community. What assets are already there and how can they be uh, advanced to help people move forward to the future of their choosing? That's why this research is important to us. It asks what is the state of the nonprofit, the Native nonprofit economy in Minnesota and what next? How can the nonprofits themselves and funders and others think about getting towards a better future. Um, so that's why this research is exciting to us. I want to thank Martin and the several other members of my staff who partnered with the folks who did this work uh, to get us here this morning. Uh, I'm really excited to hear what's to come. So with that, I'll get out of the way and turn it over to Daniel and to Jane, or back to Martin. You know, you just never know. Uh, but you can never get enough Martin. That's what I always say. So. Not really sure what that means, but I'm, I'm, I might resemble that remark. Um, I guess I just wanted to help with a little bit of a context, but I, I just wanted to, you know, share something personally. Um, my my family is is um, you know kind of uh, a product of the relocation era. Um, my my grandmother from the Leech Lake Reservation um, in the early 50s. Most of her family moved down to the Minneapolis St. Paul area. As part of uh, part of that that federal policy around you know helping create additional opportunities, you know moving Indians into urban areas. And when I um, um, got to be an adult, I moved back to my home community. Uh, went to college up there, and so my my whole adult life has been um, either on the Leech Lake Reservation. Um, I lived on the Mille Lacs Reservation with my wife for about ten years until I moved back down to the city. So now. You know, I kind of find myself as an urban Indian, and you know, I've always considered myself a reservation Indian, and, and most of my thinking and my thoughts and my, my priorities and the values that I carry today came from my home community. And so this morning when I, um, when I arrived at the foundation, and we're over by the, by the river there in St. Paul, and I, you drive across the river, so you look at the river, and you know, rivers have a significance in, in uh, native culture. And, you know, I got out of the car and I stood up and I looked to the sky and there was an eagle that was coming from the bluff to the, from the east flying right over me. And uh, he got to the other bluff and then he circled around and um, the Migazi or eagle is my due dame. And so for me, you know, sometimes I question in my own life, what is it that I'm doing? And, and coming from uh, a culture of, of trying to always be in touch with things around you and in your environment, you know, for me, it's always affirming to see that my relatives in the sky are there for me. They're listening to me and looking out. And everyone that's here today, you're meant to be here today. And so this is a good thing. It's the start of a new conversation. It's the start of a new way of looking at things. So I want to thank all of you here, and, and I really am honored to be here standing here today. 
Um, where did this work come from? Um, I just wanted to share just real briefly about that. You know, the Northwest Area Foundation is, and kind of what attracted me to the foundation is the commitment that they've had historically to Native communities. And in, our, in some of the, the, the bold steps and leadership that the foundation has provided, we're always trying to find the things that, that increase our effectiveness in giving. And we find ourselves in a leadership position and often looked to by our peers to provide guidance or direction or connections to the communities. And again, you know, coming from a reservation background, coming back to the urban, you know, we, we in philanthropy, we, we think a lot with the mind. You know, we, we do this research, we develop these logic models, we come up with these approaches. And so this, this really has started out very, very much in that vein. And to, you know, really help the native community grow as part of the community, broader community, what we decided we needed to do is we needed to first understand what that, what that environment looked like. And so about a year and a half ago, um, we started having conversations internally about, you know, what, what does this nonprofit sector look like in Indian country? Um, in reservation communities, it's, it's very small. In urban areas, it's pretty strong. And why is that? And what, what's the synergy that exists there? What's the depths of services? What's the needs? What's the impact? And so today's conversation is really about helping us ground each of us to better understand what those challenges and opportunities are. And then I think as Lemoyne, you know, so eloquently put it, then what we need to do is we need to connect those thoughts with our hearts. And then as we go out today, and as you look around the room, these are all the partners that are here to help build community, not only for the native community, but the whole community, because we're all, we're all related. And so I just really, th again, thank you for being here today and hope this is a good, meaningful, and, and please share all your, your questions and concerns that you have with us and we'll move forward. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Jane Harstead, um, who is the primary author behind this report. Jane. Thank you, Martin. Um, and thank you, Gary, and thank you, Lemoyne. Um, Buju, Jane and Dijani Kaz, Minawa, Mississauga, Eganing, and Donjaba, Minawa, Gakabi Kang, Inda. I, um, my family comes from the Mille Lacs Reservation, um, and I live in the cities now, and I came aboard this project last fall to take a look at the native, um, situation with the nonprofits in the state of Minnesota. So it is culminating in today's event where um, I'll quickly go over the uh, agenda for you. Um, so Daniel and I will go over the report. I'll do more of the quantitative um, information and he'll do a little bit more of the qualitative information. And then we'll have a little break and then we will have a community response panel made up of various community members and nonprofit organization leaders uh, who will share their stories, their strengths, their challenges, and what they are doing to face the future at this point. And then we'll have a luncheon discussion and see what kind of information we can come away from this meeting with in order to start moving in the direction that we need to be moving into. Thank you, Shannon. So I started this looking at, um, first of all, the state of Minnesota and looking at the locations of where Native programs were located. And as you can see, they are, this, this is a map of the communities in Minnesota, uh, a very broad base to start. Um, but what I found was 65, nonprofit organizations with 501c3 status. Um, lots of programs that serve Native Americans that are based within other programs. And I also took a, a look at tribal communities and the programs that they sponsor. And found that of these organizations that I took a closer look at, uh, 1,201 individuals are um, employed by these nonprofits. And we have a lot of history to go over that um, kind of brought about how all these nonprofits came 
to the places they are today. So when we looked at the population of where people have been, native people have been living in the state, uh, you can see that they are situated around the tribal communities and then in the urban areas of Minnesota, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Duluth, um, metro areas like that. So I started looking at um, some of the literature and some of the uh, reasons as to why people ended up in the areas that they're at. And I found that there are different kinds of organizations. Uh, many have evolved over time, over space, and over place. Uh, there are native-led nonprofits. There are also those programs that work under other umbrella organizations. And there are also um, programs that are sponsored by tribes. So in trying to disaggregate the data that I had, it was, it, was, it was really difficult to say, well, you belong in this category, you belong in that category. But uh, in the end, we came up with sort of a, a plan for how these organizations would fit into the scheme of this report. And it's, uh, it's a place to start talking about how this all works. So as we looked at the uh, organizations that I studied more in depth, the activities that go on with these uh, organizations are on the screen and they're also in the report, but uh, the largest is the, uh, as you can see from the education and the human services standpoint, those are where the largest areas of activity are occurring at this point, but there are so many more organizations that are doing so much more in this community. And I um, am amazed at everyone who works so diligently to provide services for our community. Uh, it was a little bit difficult to narrow down the activity areas as well because there's a lot of different scales as to uh, what service activities people do. So uh, what we came up with is on page 15, which you can look at at your leisure, but uh, to narrow it down, but yet be inclusive of all of the organizations that we looked at. I also asked questions of all of these organizations that I um, talked to and asked who do they serve? And the majority of the, the organizations serve anyone who walks in their doors. There are some organizations that have specific requirements from the funders or from the um, grants that they get that they can only serve uh, tribal people. There's also a little bit of policy and politics to go along with that as we all know, but when we're looking at something like um, the Indian Child Welfare Act, that is for those services are provided for the tribal members um, and their children and the children that need their services. So depending upon what kind of services and um, where uh, the funding comes from and what the funders have as um, regulations as far as the grants go, that is what they followed. But generally they all, most um, serve anyone who walks in their door. And then when I, I took a look at specifically where are these nonprofits located in the state compared to where the people live. And the majority of the nonprofits are located in the urban areas. Um, so there is a disproportionate amount in urban areas compared to rural areas. And um, I think Daniel will talk a little bit more about why, why is that and how, how, what can we do to help those rural organizations um, to have better um, organizational sustainability and how to help them prosper. So as you can see, a lot of them are located in the metro area. There's a, some in Duluth and right near some of the reservations. Um, but the majority are in the urban areas and I'm Part of what we looked at was the legislation and the uh, relocation policies. And 
as we delved into that data, we looked at um, uh, where they're getting their funding, and we also looked further, but, and I'll get to that in just a minute. So we looked at where, where do these nonprofits get their funding, and, and that was some of the questions that I asked in the interviews. And generally, the largest funder is the state, uh, the government, and whether it's federal, state, or county, um, and whether it's grants or contracts, it's, it's through the government that uh, these nonprofits are getting most of their money. Uh, travel contributions was the smallest portion of those um, funding sources. And many more are turning to earned revenue at this point. Um, and that's sort of a little trend that's going on is more um, working towards that, trying to earn their revenue. I looked at the top 10 organizations by their expenditures. And they are on the screen. And there, I don't think there are any surprises there. Um, these are all organizations that we're well aware of and, and know and have been in place for a while. I also looked at, once we had the data for where they're located and, um, and things like that, we, I looked at when these organizations were formed. And it turned out that a lot of them were formed right after that relocation era and um, when natives started coming to the city areas. And so the majority of the nonprofits that are in existence today were uh, born out of that era and the things that happened when they came to, the, when natives came to the city and there weren't any services and programs um, that were culturally appropriate for them. So that's where a lot of the uh, multi-service um, organizations came into being. So when I collected the data, I, I carried out 51 qualitative interviews and I looked at um, lots and lots of documents. I looked at 990 tax forms. I looked at uh, previous literature written by uh, community members. Um, Laura Waterman Woodstock from Ellie Webster from Justin Hoyneman and the uh, 2012 Blueprint, which they are still currently working on. And I also looked at census data. And what you have in front of you is the result of all of that information. And then uh, we'll be able to take some questions after um, Daniel goes a little bit over what he found with the qualitative end of that. Okay. All right, thank you, Jane. How me daki api, chante washte anape chiyuzapi. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Daniel M, and I'm the Director of Programs and Finance at Native Americans in Philanthropy. Uh, my family is from the Lower Sioux community, which is one of the four, uh, one of the Dakota communities in, within the state of Minnesota. Uh, I did grow up in the, in the cities here. I did spend some time down uh, working in, in my community, but um, I, can, I think it's safe to say that uh, um, I'm a city boy. Uh, so it's, uh, it was, I, I just want to say, uh, I want to thank the Northwest Area Foundation for being a leader in, in philanthropy and supporting Native communities. I want to say it was a pleasure and an honor to partner with the Minnesota Council on Nonprofits on pulling together this report. And I also want to give a special thank you to Jane for all of the hard work she did um, collecting the data, analyzing it, and, and pulling this, uh, the report together. I, I think it did a great job, so thank you. <laughs> So as, as Jane shared with you, we weren't just, with, uh, with this research report, we weren't just looking at the data of the, the native nonprofits in the state of Minnesota. We, we also asked them, we wanted to hear your stories. We wanted to hear from, uh, we wanted to hear from the native nonprofits what they see as their strengths. What are their, what's, uh, uh, what are the, the assets of native nonprofits? We also wanted to ask them about their challenges. You know, there's, there's reality certainly of working the, in the nonprofit field and, um, you know, there, there might be even other challenges that are faced by, uh, by native nonprofits. 
And then we also asked them if they had any recommendations for, uh, for how to collaborate, how to build relationships. And those recommendations uh, um, uh, were received in, in, in the context of for funders, for other native nonprofits, and for uh, non-native nonprofits. And then I, I would just cover, i uh, just do some, some summary, I'd summarize the report and, and do the, uh, the report conclusion. So um, that's just the overview slide there of what I'll be discussing. So the native nonprofit strengths, and you'll see these all in, in, in the report. Uh, the first one there, certainly that there is an active, and, and these, these four responses that, uh, um, uh, that, that we have here for, for the strengths. These are not all of the strengths of the native nonprofits. These were more of the four uh, main strengths that, uh, that had been received through the interviews and, and the surveys. Um, so the active community network, uh, with as connected as, as the native nonprofits and the native community is, it can seem very, uh, very small, which is, which is great. It's, uh, um, we see we see each other at uh, at cultural events, whether they're powwows in the urban communities, whether in back in our home communities and on, on within our reservations. Uh, we sit on on uh, boards of nonprofits together. Uh, we come to community forums where important research reports are shared. Uh, so we see each other in in in, in many different uh, settings. So we're we're certainly connected, and that is a a definitely a strength. Of, of native nonprofits. Uh, there are also the asset-based models of community building in looking at um, what, is, what, is, what is good, what are the assets of, uh, of the native communities in building upon and supporting our assets and in what's working rather than looking at things through a, a deficits-based model where um, you focus on all of the challenges and, and what's wrong, putting a Band-Aid on those, which is, is draining, um, and, I, and it's, it's one of those things we're focusing on the assets in, 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 in supporting um, where the passion of Native communities lies, and then finding a way to, to even fund those passions. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a strength that the, the Native communities are able to um, uh, identify those assets and then build upon them. Uh, as, as Jane just shared with you, a lot of, uh, with the uh, steady and effective leadership, we've got a number of nonprofits that are 20 plus years old, and, and one of the ways that they're able to get to uh, being so, um, so effective and so valuable to the community over a long period of time is the fact that leadership is able to guide um, the community and the staff and the board uh, towards, towards the missions of the organizations. And, and certainly having a number of, of established seasoned leaders running uh, the native nonprofit organizations in, in Minnesota is, is a strength. And then lastly, adapting, um, nonprofits adapting to stakeholder and community needs. Uh, this is a way for, um, uh, the strength is that since the, the network is so active, it is so connected, um, Native nonprofits have their ear on the ground. They know um, what the needs of the community is. If, if things are changing, the community is good about letting the nonprofits know um, that services might need to be changed up. So uh, remaining nimble, remaining flexible, um, not going with a one-size-fits-all model to uh, providing services. We know that doesn't work. Um, and that uh, uh, a strength of Native nonprofits is the fact that they can, uh, they're so adaptive. But certainly we wanted to recognize that there are challenges that Native nonprofits face. Uh, there, there are four, these are four main uh, challenges that, uh, that the nonprofits face. The, the first one there, the continual cross-culture education that needs to, that really needs to take place. It's, it's unfortunate that growing up, the history books that we were all taught from all told uh, a story from, from one perspective. And it, it doesn't mean it was wrong, it was just uh, not necessarily the Native perspective. And, and the fact that I think oftentimes people view Native people in the context of the history books and that not too often do people, um, are people able to engage with 
uh, with native communities. So there's always those questions of, um, do Indians still live in teepees? Is it Native American? Is it American Indian? Is it First Nations? Is it, uh, uh, is it indigenous peoples? Which, uh, which is the correct term to use? And, and for that, I'll give you my best, and no offense to the lawyers in the room, my best law, uh, lawyer uh, response is that it depends. It depends upon who you're talking to as to which term that, uh, uh, that you can use. So, uh, you know, just, just keep that in mind. Um, that uh, challenges to for native nonprofits is the fact that um, really coming from different worldviews and finding a way to uh, educate one another as to where each is coming from is is something that is is a continued challenge, but also it's also an opportunity as well for uh, for native nonprofits. Uh, the second one there, future leadership transitions with as many of the amazing established nonprofits that we do have in the community, it is, gonna, it is getting to that point where, or at least where uh, the leaders of the organizations are looking to, to retire or move on to their next adventure. Um, and so the, the challenge is, is ensuring that the next generation of leaders is, is prepared and, and ready to uh, continue to lead the nonprofits and, and the, uh, the amazing work that's been done um, so far. I've got pro or we've got program timeline versus funding cycles there as a challenge. Uh, this is, you know, when, when nonprofits start, as we all know, when our nonprofits engage in programs, those programs usually exist for longer than a year. However, the um, funding cycles um, generally don't last longer than a year at a time. So if you have a three-year program or project that you're working on, it's, it's great when you have that first year of funding to get started. Um, you get all excited, you get all this momentum going, but if you don't have continued funding, you're not able to um, accomplish your goals to uh, carry out your logic models. And it's, it's part of that nonprofit hustle with, as soon as you get that first year of funding, you don't know if that second year is going to, to come about. So you're constantly fundraising to uh, ensure that you can complete your, your program or your project. And then the last one there, the misconception of access to gaming resources. Uh, I, I don't know where this came from, the notion that gaming revenues, uh, as successful as they, as they have been and as generous as tribes are with their gaming resources, that they should be able to fund and support every single native person and issue uh, that, that exists. And, and Jane just shared with us the, the data that of funding that goes to native nonprofits, uh, native nonprofits reported 5% of the revenues coming from tribes. So that right there just goes to show you that as, as generous and as philanthropic as tribes are, that they're still not able to meet all of the, uh, to fund all of the needs that exist in the community. So um, I could say more about that, but I'll stop there. And uh, so then we've got rec the recommendations part of the, the report, uh, recommendations for funders uh, to learn about native communities, access, native intelligence, that is certainly an asset of a, a strength of, of native nonprofits. Uh, work together to develop joint metrics for, uh, you know, more or less you're working on the exact same issue, might just have a couple different ways of of, of accomplishing the goal, so uh, look at different ways to, uh, how you're measuring success and, and, and work together uh, uh, toward that. Uh, you know, I just, I just talked about provide long-term funding to support programs and operations. Adopt logic models that are based on community assets as opposed to community deficits, so continue to support uh, the strengths of Native communities, Native nonprofits, and, and and kind of with that first point there with your metrics and the way that you, you measure success. And then lastly, support youth and development, uh, leadership development as a part of program funding. And thinking about the, uh, the future leadership transitions, engaging the youth, I mean, it's, it's cliche to say that the, the children are our future, but they certainly are, and we need to make sure that we prepare them uh, to become the next generations of leaders and set them up for, uh, to be successful. And, and another thing I wanted to say with, uh, with that, at least that first point there, this is all about relationship building. Build relationships with native nonprofits, native communities, get to know one another. 
Uh, there is an excellent resource that, uh, that, that you can check out that if you don't have a copy of it, it is on the Native Americans in Philanthropy website. It's called Context is Everything. It was, it was a wonderful publication that was uh, author, the lead author was Wilma Mankiller, and it's all about how to engage in, in relationship building with Native communities. So if you haven't had a chance to check out Context is Everything, uh, please, please do so and let me know if, if you need a, a copy of, of that. We have recommendations for non-native nonprofits. Uh, one, develop partnerships with native nonprofits to provide culturally relevant programming to native clients. So if you are a non-native nonprofit and you provide programs and services to native clients and you're you're looking to, to find the best way to provide culturally appropriate uh, services to them. Uh, look to partner with Native organizations, ask them, you know, work with them to see the best way to, to meet the needs of the client. The second one there, learn about Native nonprofits and identify those organizations that have similar missions. I mean, this is all about relationship building. You're going to notice a common theme with me when I get to the next point there, relationship building, relationship building, relationship building. <laughs> Uh, I said it three times. Uh, in, uh, the third one there, engage and include native nonprofits in your networks uh, when working on broader community issues. It's native nonprofits, native communities do not exist within a vacuum. Uh, what affects the, the larger community does affect native communities. So if you're working on an issue that, uh, that is more general, broader in, in, in its uh, in, in context, Include native nonprofits, include native communities, engage with them, and, and work together to uh, resolve uh, the, the issue at, at hand. And then lastly, recommendations for native nonprofits. Learn about other native nonprofits that serve, uh, that serve the community and look for opportunities to work collectively. Uh, support youth engagement in programming efforts, pro proactively address changing demographics, and incorporate into future thinking. This is. Um, this comes along with a continue to adapt and be flexible to the native non uh, to the the native community and and the needs of it. Of it. Uh, prepare for lead for transitions in leadership through mentorship. So support leadership development efforts of the the emerging leaders, uh, and and continue to prepare them. Engage in success succession planning, uh, but really prepare the next generation of leaders to, uh, uh, to continue the, the work. And then lastly, strengthen relationships and support with tribal governments that are providing services in urban areas. And I think, I mean, this, this works back and forth, whether it's in the urban area or it's in the, in the, in the rural uh, community, in the reservation community. Uh, in my opinion, tribal governments shouldn't be providing serve programs and serve, shouldn't be the only one providing programs and services to, uh, to the reservation communities. And Jane shared uh, the chart there that most of the native nonprofits exist with, live, or are in the urban communities and that they are, there are those that exist out, out state, um, but there could be more. And, and it could be a way for urban uh, nonprofits to look to expand their services and provide those services in, in the reservation community. So um, work with tribes, engage them, and see, uh, see where it could be a good fit to, uh, to provide those programs and services. And then lastly, the report conclusions here. I just grabbed this paragraph out of the report, so uh, if you want to go ahead and read that there in your program, that's where it is. Uh, but I, uh, I at least wanted to, to leave you with this, that, uh, that nonprofits are strong, they face challenges, and through building relationships, we are better equipped to work toward healthy and sustainable Native communities. Thank you. So, so with that, we, we have... Uh, we have maybe five minutes or so here before we transition to the community panel. Just wanted to see if there were maybe uh, one or two questions that, that, uh, that people had. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a microphone, so if you do, you'll just have to speak loud. Yes, I should. 
I've said my disclaimer right away that I have tried to find every nonprofit, native nonprofit organization, and if I have missed any, please, um, I will give you my email address, and we will take um, additions to the report for a while. Joanne. I didn't look at other communities to compare. I looked at other communities to see what they have been doing, but I didn't compare them, no. This report is the first that looks at Native nonprofits as a whole, so this is the uh, foundation from which we can start building those relationships and, and working towards our goals. So that's uh, what this report started to do, and it's meant to be the first of other reports that will build, um, like you were asking, Joy, on the on the differences between different nonprofits.